Hello, my name is Keith Kreischer and I'm the executive director of the IMC. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to track three of our Winter IoT Days event presented by the IoT M2M Council. The topic for this track is connectivity and we'll be talking about a range of issues within connectivity. Uh, you can see the full schedule in the resources section of your interface. Uh, let me start by saying that I hope everyone in our audience, as well as among our panelists and presenters, uh, is staying safe and well in these uh, sometimes difficult times. Uh, before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets that you can use. All the widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. The webcast is being streamed through your computer today, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear the presenters. If your slides are delayed, pushing F5 on your keyboard will refresh the page. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available later today and can be accessed using the same audience links sent to you earlier. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget. The presenters may answer the questions at the end of each session, but please feel free to put your questions forward at any time during the presentations. Any unanswered questions, and I like to emphasize this, if we don't get to your question, never fear we will be able to associate your question with your registration info and our panelists will be able to get back to you uh, after this event. Um, just a quick word, I wanna change gears with just a quick word about the IMC for those on the call that may not know us. Uh, the IMC is the largest trade association serving the IoT sector with 25,000 enterprise users, product makers and designers and apps developers that deploy I IoT solutions as rank-and-file adopter members. The IMC Board of Governors is comprised of 35 or so of the most influential IoT solutions providers, including some very large companies that you know, uh, Microsoft Azure, Vodafone, Quectel, Tata Communications, but also smaller companies providing cutting-edge solutions. So if you're an IoT adopter, please join us to access our conferences, our template RFP program, our surveys, and generally best-in-class IoT content, and if you're uh, an IoT solutions provider, please join us to access the largest community of adapters for purposes of thought leadership, lead generation, promotion, and research. And with that, I will hand off to my very good friend, uh, Matt Hatton, who is a principal at Transforma Insight. Matt, good afternoon. Hey, thank you, Keith. Good afternoon. Thanks for that uh, that introduction. I'm glad to hear you getting the, the housekeeping out of the way. A um, little bit of an intro from me. I should introduce myself first off. Yeah, Matt Hatton, I'm one of the founding partners at Transform Insights. I'm an industry analyst who's been looking at this IoT space for, for well over a decade uh, before it was called IoT. Um, just before we came on air, um, they say not to talk about what, uh, what you were talking about off camera, but uh, there was a lot of discussion about how connectivity is a, a popular topic and we've got a, a good number of attendees here and it's probably hard, hard very hardly surprising that we're talking uh, a lot about connectivity these days because it's a it's a very exciting uh, space. There's probably more exciting stuff happening in, in connectivity at the moment than there has done uh, for quite a number of years. Structure of the session will run up to the, the hour. Uh, we'll have some uh, introductory comments and, and a few slides from the uh, the participants in the in the session first off, uh, and then we'll get into a uh, first off a structured a Q and A session. I'll be leading the the discussion on some of the uh, interesting areas that are uh, hot button topics for for IoT connectivity at the at the moment. Uh, and then uh, you'll have the opportunity, or we'll have the opportunity to address some of the questions that are coming in over the Q and A. There's already uh, one in the hopper, so if you've got any questions that are stimulated by the uh, the topics of discussion today, then do pop them in the Q and A box, as Keith uh, mentioned, and we will get to those about you know, halfway, halfway through the, uh, the, the conversation. Uh, so after that, uh, I have the opportunity now to uh, do, a, you know, to, to say a few words on, on some of the um, 
interesting trends that we're seeing in, in IoT connectivity at the moment. And this is just some of them, and we'll get on to talk about these later, I'm sure. Um, I've put them in one slide. This is drawn from a whole bunch of stuff that we've done over the years at, at Transform Insights and, uh, and available. Check out our blog. I recommend looking at that. So things like um, the concept of the thin IoT stack. So we've got a whole uh, heap of technologies that, that have uh, really started to mature that really make um, IoT much, much easier to, to deploy. You've got things like the, the platformization of the space, simplifying things. You've got uh, new access technologies in the form of some of the LPWA uh, technologies. You've got operating systems that are more designed uh, specifically for, for IoT and a whole range of things that are that are helping to, uh, to, to really drive that, drive down the price or drive down the, the complexity of deploying. Um, it also, it wouldn't be an analyst slide without uh, a chart showing some forecasts. So the bottom left, you can see um, our uh, predictions on, on growth. I won't talk about that too much other than to say we've got really big growth uh, coming in the low power wide area space and, and cellular connectivity overall, going from about a billion connections to about 5 billion connections over the next 10 years. So there's some, some big growth uh, coming. Not all necessarily um, good news, though. We've got some... Uh, some stumbling blocks on the way. One of those is we're seeing some quite dramatic price erosion going on in the in the space. We talk a little bit in some of our material about uh, the concept of one dollar IoT, where uh, for a lot of the the low power connections and for some of the things around, say, environmental monitoring and some of those low data use cases, we're heading towards maybe a dollar a year in in connectivity. Uh, and how do you you cope with that as a as a connectivity provider? And there's there's options for doing things like moving up the stack, pursuing um, vertical solutions. You know, if 80% of the solution value is in the in the application, why not go after that? Well, it's pretty challenging. It's uh, it's it's a, a heavily contested space. It's not always a a perfect solution. And then top right, uh, this is a concept that we we talk about a lot: hyperscale. Uh, connectivity and how to be a hyperscale connectivity provider. A lot of connectivity providers are looking at how they uh, scale their offerings to, to be able to support uh, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of, of connections with things like better integration with, with cloud platforms and uh, having a connectivity which is really scalable in terms of low touch uh, onboarding and, and, and support. Uh, and then bottom right, IoT MVNOs. It's uh, it's an exciting time in the MVNO space, and we're seeing a lot of uh, a, a lot of growth in that in that space. A lot of M and A, a lot of investments going into that space. So there's there's a lot happening there. In fact, there's a lot happening across all of of, uh, of IoT connectivity. And we'll talk about a, a bunch of other trends that I haven't mentioned. Uh, things like 5G, things like uh, the bundling of hardware and connectivity, uh, eSIM, a whole whole load of other uh, other topics. We'll get on to that in, in a bit. Firstly, I would like to uh, give our speakers the opportunity to, to say a few words. Uh, first up will be uh, Brian from Telit. Brian, over to you. Thank you. Hey, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Garropy, and I'm a regional sales manager in Telit's connectivity division, and I'm based in Chicago. And this slide here is really just a quick introduction into the Telit offering. Uh, think of Telit as an enablement company. Uh, we enable products, we help companies bring products to market, but we don't have complete solutions that we put out. Uh, we, you know, we're not a box company. Uh, but what this slide represents are just three different divisions within Telit. So on the left here is all the uh, hardware. You know, we're a module manufacturer. We manufacture cellular, uh, short range modules, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, uh, GNSS uh, type of um, uh, module solutions. So we have all the hardware available to the market. And then the second two are just our services offering. Um, so we have connectivity. Uh, we are an MVNO and uh, we aggregate all of these networks into one platform. Uh, and we have a software division. So we call that device wise. Uh, and it's typically uh, an industrial IoT kind of application, uh, software managing um, a factory setting and assets within a factory. But we've borrowed some of that technology and some of that intelligence and has uh, and we've put it into our connectivity offering. And so we're we're offering a full stack uh, solution here between the hardware and the network and some device management software uh, to enable products in the market. And over here on the right, it's just showing our customer you know, all of that uh, information and uh, products and services allow them to send their application data up into the cloud 
uh, whether it's AWS or Azure or wherever it is, and uh, and it completes the solution. So those are the three different divisions within Telit. And the second slide here is just talking about um, the different technologies. You know, within our uh, our portfolio of of modules, we can we can support anything. So here on the top, you can see all the high cat applications, and of course, video or telematics and routers for failover business continuity kind of solutions. And then we have a whole uh, host of um, low cat uh, options for our customers. So, you know, cat one, cat M one, uh, narrow band, and those for you know really basic applications, wearables, metering, smart city type of solutions. Uh, but that gives you a sense of what Telit is. We're an enablement company. We help companies bring products to market. Um, so thank you. Great stuff. And uh, next up we have uh, Ajay. Ajay, over to you. Thank you, Matt. Um, uh, Brief introduction about myself. I'm Ajay. I'm the uh, head of the IoT unit here, as well as the CTO of iBasis. Uh, a little bit of an introduction about iBasis. So um, we've been around since 1996 as a startup company, initially starting in voice. Um, our DNA first comes uh, being owned by an MNO, uh, was KPN. We've now owned by Tufan. Tufan is a uh, holding company. Um, we have several businesses, uh, voice, messaging, mobile roaming, IoT is one of them. And um, one of the things that uh, iBasis slash Tufan have been doing over the past three years is we've been consolidating um, the international parts of different operators. Just last week, we announced uh, the, our sixth acquisition. And I'll talk a bit about uh, the company that we acquired was uh, Symphony, um, a connectivity management platform. And I'll talk a little bit in the next slide as to what that is. But in terms of uh, what we have before that is the international parts of KPN, Mio, which is a Portuguese operator, Nosh, which is a Portuguese operator, SFR, French operator, as well as Altis Dominicana um, in the Dominican Republic. These have all been integrated into the iBasis network. So uh, think of us as a one-stop shop for your international connectivity needs. And I'll briefly talk about what do we do in IoT. So our entire focus in IoT is uh, on eSIMs slash ISIM slash another word is EUICC. Um, so basically we offer a single SKU with the relationships that we have with the operators across the world. We procure the profiles, put that in the cloud in a secure uh, area. And then based on patented uh, mobile network selection logic, we could download the appropriate profile onto the card based on where the card is. And it could also be done based on business logic. It could be based on rates. It could be based on quality. We have a um, bunch of gateways that are located across the world where we can break out the traffic uh, to provide the best user experience. Um, especially from a latency point of view. And the part that I just want to talk about here is the connectivity management platform. So think of it as all of the connectivity that's out there that we provide needs to be managed by a state-of-the-art platform. And that's the acquisition that we just made last week, Symphony. So that platform is um, essentially what it does is it takes care of the entire customer onboarding experience all the way from setting up your uh, plans, to ordering cards, to tracking the amount of data per card, to uh, reporting what your margin is, not just for yourself, but also for the value chain that uh, you're selling to. Um, the data that comes out from here also, we have other nifty things on policy control, for example, where we could do different things to the data and of course the analytics behind it. So um, we can discuss more during the session and I'll hand it off to uh, Nick. Thank you.
Thanks, AJ. So um, my name is Nick Kitson from uh, Digi International. Uh, my background is, is in a range of um, communication systems. I, I grew up in Vodafone, uh, working for a number of the global areas in the service provider world. And I've, I've done extensive um, uh, so-called industry training in, in Juniper Networks and Cisco, working in the mobility and uh, broadband network area. So here in Digi, we have been um, working in the industrial IoT space for over 30 years. So we have um, over 100 million devices deployed around the world uh, in the most demanding environments using all sorts of different technologies. So one of the, the advantages of Digi is we're not here to tell you that one technology is best. We're here to tell you which technology is best to grow your business. So our, our core approach is figuring out for all of the different characteristics you have in your deployment, how does that map to a specific technology? Because the, I, I guess the, the most important thing that I can leave you all with is that one technology is not going to solve every problem. There, there is a need for specialties. But one of the, the really interesting pieces that we've come across this year is not all technologies will survive. There's only so much competition in one space we can have before a winner must be announced. And we certainly have uh, cellular and mobile technologies is king of the hill for for um, for the global piece. We've, we've certainly got Laura Wayne as one of the king of the hills of uh, private networking technologies and, and the other um, sort of second and third players are, are rapidly losing the ability to scale. And there's a couple of other winners here on the podium that solve very specific um, economic and technical problems that uh, our, our global customers are, are looking to, to have. So, so we, from a product perspective, uh, have a number of pieces that we do. We're really a full stack provider. So we provide hardware tools. We provide connectivity and networking software, uh, hardware tools as well. And we provide cloud platforms for managed services. And we work with MVNOs and other communications providers. And, and there's a whole case of um, how do we bundle those connectivity services together? Who's the actual buyer and who's packaging them in? And I think a lot of the go-to-market um, structure in the way SIM packages and various other things are put together um, really determine whether we get to that $1 IoT. You know, if we're selling direct to an enterprise, that's very different to, to selling to a, a device manufacturer who then packages it up to a, an IoT company who packages up to an enterprise. So it'd be very interesting to kind of see uh, people's views and questions in that area. I just put this together not so much to talk more about Digi's products, but really to to talk about the um, the multiverse of technologies and kind of where they apply and where some technologies are light years ahead of others. And I, I took the the axes on this to be um, almost uh, like a balance beam. So if you're really after speed and roaming, um, that's kind of one end of the spectrum. But coverage, cost, and battery life are at the other extreme end of this, and one pulls on the other. If you want speed then the, the energy cost of that is always going to be higher than something that's maybe slower or less frequently um, polled. So things like the latency of your service is far more important than the latency of your technology. Any of these technologies can provide you a notification in a few seconds, but the, the difference is, am I monitoring something 10,000 times a day, like I may be, say, with a medical device, or am I monitoring something you know, once every hour or two? And the cost of... Um, buying the energy source, be it battery, be it solar, or the uh, the cost of replacing it if it's a battery becomes far more important than is my LTE network faster than my LoRa network. So, so those are the actually application level discussions that become vastly more important to customers to decide in their business case. We're not comparing technologies here, we're comparing total cost of management, which includes people time and the infrastructure that goes around our technology, like microcontrollers, like software, uh, like storage, for example. And, and kind of the way we see the world is when you stretch it out to one extreme end, you know, satellite is that ubiquitous coverage piece. It really doesn't have the capacity to do anything meaningful with speed, uh, but it, it fills a, a hole in, in the whole uh, global coverage map and that it's just not economic, say, to put a lot of 5G networks everywhere. Uh, and then as you sort of transition across the spectrum, you get to LoRaWAN, it is the perfect scenario for extremely high volume uh, distributed um, communications. But again, it, it's not really addressing the speed. And as we start to get to things that need 
uh, high performance, they work where the people are, uh, you know, we start to get into the 4G, 5G technologies. And our view is all of them could even mix in one single use case in many cases, um, because they offer different coverage models, they offer different economic models. And so Digi's role in the IoT world is, is not to say which one is better, it's to say which one is most appropriate and, and lead customers based on you know business outcomes and use cases down the path of, of putting those in place where they are most appropriate. Okay, I'm, I'm back to me. Back to you. Uh, good <laughs> stuff, everyone. Thank, thanks for those uh, those few words of, of introduction. Um, f first topic I want to touch on, and, and Nick, actually, I'll, I'll stick with you. 5G, okay, we've, we've talked a little bit about, uh, or everybody's mentioned the uh, low power technologies and, and, and so on, and we'll come on to those uh, a little bit. But what about full fat 5G? What's what's the market telling you? Is there is there that much demand? Is there that much interest? What's, what's, um, what's been your experience on that? So I, I guess, you know, 5G, like all of the Gs that came before it, uh, were always initially launched with higher speed. No one comes out with a new network and says, hey, let's make it cheaper and slower. That, that just that just doesn't happen. So what we see in the adoption curve is that the really high performance networking capabilities are, are the ones that are obviously the highest value, the ones that are gonna go first. So fixed wireless, great. Um, we're certainly gonna see, I think, automotive and a few other areas that where the coverage and the speed offer a, a net benefit. But I guess where, where we're not going to see the first wave is, is embedded IoT. There's, there's really no need for the, the performance um, when it comes at such a premium cost. And there's plenty of other alternatives. So I think we're going to see 5G more as an aggregation technology for a lot mm. of the, the actual um, industrial IoT out there. And, and over time, if they can achieve something similar to what we already have with 4G, the, you know, the NB-IoT um, type pieces, and we get it at an appropriate price point, you know, very low cost to operate. Uh, we can run it anywhere in the world and, and say, uh, you know, very low cost to purchase the chipsets, then that's gonna start to make it into the sensor world because the, the fundamental of, of the sensor space is that the vast majority of investment goes into the device and goes into the application and, and the connectivity costs represent a relatively small portion at the sensor level. Where it becomes exciting for, I think, connectivity providers is when you aggregate thousands of them onto 4G, 5G pairs. Okay, that's, that, that's interesting. I mean, what what we're hearing for from um, from the market is maybe it's more about private networks. Brian, I don't know whether you you've got some perspective on this. You talked to you talked about the sort of bifurcation of the of of the market into into these sort of high bandwidth, low, low bandwidth. That on that 5G side of things, mostly in private networks, are you you seeing it or or across the board for for <clears throat> telling? Um, I wouldn't say private networks across the board as of yet. You know, technologies like CVRS and just private LTE in general. I think um, there's a use case for it. You know, whether it's a uh, a factory industrial IoT kind of uh, setting, um, certainly at campus. Um, you know, those are where companies are just looking to control more of that, you know, infrastructure and, and signal, you know, availability. Um, but uh, we're not seeing a huge push into uh, into those technologies quite yet. Um, mm -hmm. So I think uh, maybe it's a little early uh, for uh, uh, for that technology. Okay. And, and Ajay, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing on this sort of MVNO side of things, it, it tends to be an N minus one technology generation uh, uh, kind of a dynamic where um, MVNOs will always address this sort of N minus one technology. Uh, so 5G doesn't tend to uh, crop up, it, it, is my experience. Is that your experience as well uh, from the from the MVNO stand, standpoint? Well, from, so from what we're seeing as, as kind of what's uh, Nick had mentioned earlier, which is um, the we seeing fixed wireless wireless backup, so use cases with a lot of lot of data, what we call the high data use cases. Those are kind of uh, customers asking for five G because consumers is, uh, have it today, uh, uh, especially in the U S. For example, um, they want the same thing to do say, on the routers, for example, but on the the uh, the what's called a massive uh, IoT in 5G uh, that's a ways off. 
Um, I don't know if anybody really has implemented anything there. Um, also, the use cases that actually drive that in terms of critical communications, we're really way off from that. So uh, it's the the what's called the EMBB part, the mobile broadband part. That's really what's uh, the initial driver for 5G. We are seeing that for sure. Okay, and and on the low power side of, of, of things, the the MMTC, um, you you seeing much uh, interest? And I'll I'll come to to uh, to, to Brian and, and and Nick on this as well. But just just first, up, um, y are you seeing a lot of interest? MBIOT, LTE, M, maybe even LoRa, and and well, I was going to say Sigfox, but let's um, we'll we'll, uh, we'll tackle that one maybe later. So what we see is actually. Um, and to be honest, there's a bit of confusion in the market. Um, so what we see is uh, a lot of demand for either LTEM or NBIOT. Um, and the volumes that some of the customers are looking at deploying are pretty big. So uh, we do a lot of work with the device manufacturers. Um, so folks like Telet, for example. So we've got some of those as our customers. And what we see is the um, the exponential growth is like the inflection is slowly building up there and mm. uh, on low power. And between those two on LTEM and NBIOT, the reason why I said there's uh, confusion in the marketplace is, you know, both of those technologies bring different things to the table. Um, mm. NBIOT has a ways to go in terms of uh, being ready, so to say, with respect to uh, what uh, customers need, developers need, um, versus LTEM, which is our preferred technology, um, and so we we are seeing we seeing a big drive for that. Um, and particularly preferred technology because it's deployed in more countries, and 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 there's more, and there's roaming agreements, and there and it, and it behaves more like existing cellular technologies, whereas MBIoT is slightly different, more kind of national deployments, I guess. Well, it's a combination. So that's one. The lack of roaming agreements is number two. The restrictions on bandwidth is number three, which is actually pretty big, especially if you have a device that's out there. Uh, the uh, And if you want to do any kind of uh, firmware update to the device, it becomes very difficult. So things like that start to make it more challenging. It, it's kind of very restrictive use cases you could go after. Um, so what the more educated customers actually are the ones who right off the bat, they prefer LTEM, which is our preference as well. It just makes uh, life a lot easier. Um, and the same power saving technologies that you have, like uh, power saving mode as well as EDRX, that's also available. It's available on both of them. Yeah. Nick, same same from the Digi standpoint. You you also seeing more interest in LTEM than than MBIoT, and are are you seeing uh, demand for these low power technologies growing rapidly overall? Yeah, it's definitely growing exponentially. We're seeing different uh, approaches around the world in terms of preferences. So there's a there's a really strong bias in, in Europe. For um, for utilizing LoRaWAN as the sort of the starter option, there's a very strong mm. bias in the US for um, uh, CAD M1, and there's a very strong bias in Asia for um, everything that'll get it to work. So what we find <laughs> though is the, the 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 devices really need to support them all because there is just no ubiquitous coverage footprint. There's no business case to start putting LTE M or, or NBIT in places where there aren't people. So putting net new coverage just doesn't make sense. It's it's an overlay technology and it works brilliantly for that. So we're finding that our devices are often exactly the same device with a with a very um, simplistic low cost deployment method that looks exactly the same as cellular. So with cellular, you, you pre-provision a SIM, you turn it on and it works. So we've done the same for LoRa, for Zigbee, for satellite. So all of those technologies, you just, you just literally give it a uh, flick the power switch and you're on board and the vast majority of the cost is the installation and the deployment the, uh, the the connectivity is a tiny tiny at most six percent piece of, of what we see as the um, the total cost that the end customer pays so we're finding that a device or or a set of devices that can support 
um, one or the other and be deployed in say different countries or in different um, locations within countries. Like, for example, factory floor, you know, LoRa is the absolute preferred option. Whereas, you know, wide area on roads and, and for high mobility, LTM is the is the absolute option. So we're really seeing one device deployed with multiple use cases. It's not a not a scenario of let let's go after um, the, the CAD M1 business and just sort of force feed it to every even installation within the same customer. It, it's mix and match based on geography and service availability. That's that's interesting. But but are you seeing some? Um... I mean, obviously, we've got technology fragmentation in that in that space to a to a certain extent, as you mentioned, different regions preferring different technology. Um, and, but is that causing headaches in terms of SKUs for different markets or having to include multiple technologies, whereas historically you might not have had to do? Is it, it you know, do, do we need a bit more uh, rationalization, shall we say? I guess the advantage did you have? Has is that we make a consistent module or system that can work anywhere. We we can somewhat plug and play. I think that's that's very challenging if you look at the say module environment for um, most vendors in say across say Laura and, and Celia. There's no foot, common footprint between the two. There's no common standards. There's no body that works between them. And you know that's where Digi provides the unique piece. We can have exactly the same form factor for Laura, cellular, et cetera. And so customers managing their SKUs, it's a fairly straightforward item. Um, but mm. often the case, you know, for example, I think there's a question there on public safety. So we're involved in a public safety bid and we have scenarios where they're doing construction work. So hundreds of thousands of, uh, of feet of uh, construction sites where they need uh, sensors throughout their entire um, road cone and, and safety infrastructure. And that, that's done project by project. By far, LoRa is the most exciting option for that um, because it can be deployed in a hotspot mode. You don't need to cover the whole nation. But then we have to do crash barriers all around the country. And, and LoRa is just a, honestly a fairly terrible technology because it just doesn't have the gateways deployed over you know 50 uh, yeah, states here in the United States. So, so Cellular by far is the best option. It's exactly the same device technology. It's exactly the same cloud, but we're deploying uh, a different sort of carrier option for, for each of those. Um, in, in those scenarios. So it really comes down to where you're putting it and, and what's kind of your, uh, your, your economic envelope. Um, it, it's not a, uh, we always use cellular and here's the, here's the rationale why, or we always use Laura and here's the rationale why. Okay, good stuff. Brian, the Telit view, are you seeing a lot of, lot of uh, more to skew towards MBIOT or towards LTEM? I'm not sure whether you've got a LoRa offer out there. What, what's the what's been the experience for you guys? <clears throat> um, we haven't seen narrowband take off yet. Um, okay. You know, our modules will support both. There'll be Cat1, CatM with narrowband and 2G fallback, those kind of uh, variants. But uh, we haven't had that kind of flagship customer come in with enough volume to warrant some integration for a narrow band offering. So, um, and, and I think the reason why CAT-M is uh, more widely adopted is because the carriers treat traditional LTE traffic and CAT-M traffic the same. So for them, there's very little differences. Of course, if, if two entities have a, uh, a CAT-M roaming agreement, um, there are you know power save modes like ADRX uh, that come into play but it's not absolutely necessary for them to have a, a true CAD-M roaming agreement. If they have an LTE roaming agreement, the, the data is going to flow. So we're seeing a wide adoption of the CAD-M. Um, certainly the cost of the module is a, is a factor, but just being able to write off of additional or traditional LTE uh, roaming agreements allows the technology uh, to deploy more rapidly. Um, and it, it's fragmented. You know, you look at every country throughout Europe, um, uh, and everyone's doing something different. Um, I think as of today, there are 60 CAD-M networks uh, deployed globally and over 100 narrowband networks, uh, 110 or whatever the number is today. Uh, but you know, like um, it, uh, Ajay said, that there's very little roaming uh, availability with narrowband today. So it's a challenge. You could have a, a narrowband offering from say Telstra in Australia, but you're not taking that SIM somewhere else. and experiencing another uh, narrow band network and have kind of ubiquitous coverage and this roaming that you do on the on the cat m side so mm -hmm. i think um it's going to take some time we're in that ramp period of maybe all these network operators will start to 
uh, get together uh, when it comes to narrow band roaming agreements, start to execute those. And over time, and it, what is it, two years maybe before it really becomes, okay, now, now I can send my narrow band SIM from operator, operator A around the world and I'm gonna be able to hit these other networks. Um, so I think, you know, just those kind of points, it points to LTE M as being the dominant uh, technology as of right now. Yeah, it's interesting the roaming question because we we saw quite a flurry of activity maybe 12 months 24 months ago some something like that to get those roaming agreements up, up and going and then not an awful lot since since then maybe operators focused on other things i mean coping with the pandemic and so on is, is probably more of a priority than than uh, than that exactly no i i would imagine there's not a, a huge priority in establishing those roaming agreements because the market isn't demanding it um as quite yet the market will demand it, they will have to do it. It's just a matter of time. And again, those large enterprise customers that come in with you know, some, some application that's perfect for narrowband. You know, I think of narrowband as a street lamp application, tank level monitoring. I wake up, I send a kilobyte of data and I go back to sleep kind of application. But um, so there's plenty of use cases for narrowband. It just hasn't taken off. Um, as soon as those roaming agreements start to get more established, I think you'll see uh, companies um, establishing a, uh, a narrow band offering and their their solution. When the modules are less expensive, of course, you're stripping it down to the bare bones. So it's a it's a co cost savings, of course, N not cost savings on the connectivity side. A, a megabyte is a megabyte, but certainly on the hardware side, um, there's some savings. Good stuff. Okay, I'm gonna. And I think part of it comes it. down to the economics of the Please, infrastructure. Come. So. You know, when we look at um, how to do roaming for it, uh, for for standard uh, broadband users, you know, that's you know tens of dollars worth of revenue per device per per month when they're visiting or or roaming to a to a B in country. You, know, you start to think about how much infrastructure required in terms of investment. We spent in in my Vodafone days sixty dollars per uh, user whenever we did a massive billing upgrade and billing at a per on a, on a per device basis that that's years worth of connectivity in the nbit space so just putting in the back end oss bss to even bill for this that that's kind of where laura wan roaming has has been challenged the technology is brilliant works fantastically around the world um, but the economic models behind it are just not catching up and i think um, the oss bss infrastructure is vastly overpriced for what is needed in the nbit world and that's kind of why we're seeing you know, LoRa take off in the in the low power device world because we can aggregate thousands of devices behind a single 4G, 5G bearer, and we don't don't have to arbitrage the the cents for this device and the five cents for that device. But it, it, the the challenge is that um, there, there tends to be a, um, a narrow focus on this this uh, the connectivity or even the device cost uh, as a as a single thing rather than this kind of holistic issue of well actually how, how much is it going to cost me to deploy it or if i've got to switch my devices out what's what's the the cost associated with that or if it goes into a different market what's my what's my time to market or what my supply chain issues there's much more of a holistic thing to be to be thought about and nick i think you you touched on that in your in your introductory uh, comments yeah. it's it's not just the Price of the connectivity or the price of the device. It's the it's the pain for the enterprise that if it doesn't work or or, or whatever. We we did a a survey with with Oracle just recently and and cost of connectivity is about the least of the the enterprise's uh, worries when it comes to how to deploy an IoT solution. Um, so I think that that sort of speaks for itself on on that topic. Mm -hmm. um, I want to change. Um, Change tax a little bit onto another topic, and we will get to some some uh, some questions from the audience in in, in just a moment. Um, uh, Ajay, I want to come to you on uh, permanent roaming and some of the the challenges associated with that. We've seen some um, some issues relating to um, operators being um, uh, or, or permanent roaming connections being deactivated. We've seen the introduction of some monthly recurring charges from some network operators. Just interested in knowing uh, how you're seeing those issues about permanent roaming, either regulatory or commercial, uh, being overcome. Have you have you got some perspectives on on that? Yeah. So it is a uh, it's it's a fairly big issue in the market, and what happened is with COVID. Um, um, you know, operators were expecting roaming to basically die. Um, but 
what they did see several operators was uh, the networks lighting up like Christmas trees. Um, and when they dug into it, what they found out was that they were IoT devices. Basically, uh, there was no travel, so it couldn't be consumers. It was IoT devices. Um, there's a regulatory angle. There's also um, the um, you know the 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 poaching of the visited operator poaching the local operator's business. There's that angle too. Um, so usually the definition is you are typically, I mean, there's a lot of definitions of permanent roaming, but usually it's around if you exceed 90 days of roaming in a particular network, you are permanently roaming on that network. And um, operators take do not take that very kindly when you're doing that. There are some operators who are very strict, especially in the U.S., if they do detect that, they could cut you off. They'd give you um, typically a, a short warning. And right after that, especially if a device is, you know, uh, has been deployed somewhere and you could have tens of thousands of devices deployed somewhere, you're then at the mercy of whoever that you bought the SIM cards from to figure out the connectivity solution to that. And it becomes a real nightmare. So we've had some customers coming to us with uh, specifically those kind of problems. Um, the solution that we have and we continue to um, grow with is our EUICC solution, where the profiles that we onboard are basically uh, permanent. I mean, it's really not roaming, it's a local profile. So you are um, taking care of that permanent roaming aspect I was just talking about. In fact, I did see one of the questions uh, that uh, is out there is from a US perspective, in December of last year, we did announce our integration of our EUICC with the Verizon network, mm -hmm. where you can dynamically download the Verizon profile onto our EUICC. So, um, and with that, uh, the permanent roaming issue really gets solved. So um, the, the beauty of a solution like that is that it's not just one operator. In a particular country, you can have profiles with multiple operators and you could truly get to network independence because you're not getting a SIM card from a particular operator and getting the coverage only of that operator if you look at the US, for example, you know, you go up to Maine and you take one of the big operator SIM cards, it just doesn't work. Uh, yeah. And there are several places like that in the US where you need the best coverage of the best operator in that particular location. So um, yeah, coming back to your question on permanent roaming, it is a big issue. It's, uh, it's definitely something, um, if you look at some countries like Brazil, for example, it is an issue by regulation. So based on taxes in that particular country, you have to ensure that you have a solution for permanent roaming. Go to Australia. It's the same thing over there where the local operator over there is very careful to ensure that there's no permanent roaming there. Go to Turkey, China, India. Um, so many countries have these restrictions and you have to be careful about what you're stepping into. Mm. Yeah, so there's a there's a recognition of this as a as an issue, I think, and and ESIM does does seem to to provide the, the the solution. I don't know from the hardware standpoint, Brian, you 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 may well be uh, close to this. Are you seeing um, more demand on the hardware side for eSIM and and even the um, the, the next step on in, in terms of iSIM? Um, is that is that coming through? It is. Um, you know, we're we're seeing demand for it. I think what we're initially seeing is more demand for multi mz and think about that um, permanent roaming restriction. If you can get a localized, <clears throat> excuse me, a localized MZ, um, whether it's an EU ICC donor or an MZ donor, you can kind of achieve the same thing, which is a localized presence. So he's right, all those countries, Canada is another one, you know, Brazil, it was mentioned 90 days, Brazil has like a 30 day, you know, they don't mess around, they, they'll knock something off the network without question. So if you can get a localized MZ, uh, to be able to bring into that product. There's no threat of permanent roaming and you're leveraging, you know, a, 
kind of technically they're SIM on their network, so the, the data rates will come down um, as opposed to an international roaming SIM going into Brazil and maybe it's a different zoned price. You're now having basically a, a native SIM uh, from a Brazilian carrier that gives you the lowest possible rate uh, and then no threat of permanent roaming. Um, but we are, uh, from a hardware perspective, we're seeing companies that are interested in this technology. <clears throat> I think of the UICC um, specifically as um, a fork in the road. Um, I think a great use case is just an alarm panel company. Their technician goes out to the field, puts the panel on the wall, it's residential security, and they want the ability to uh, make a decision at that time of installation. Um, I want my product to default to Verizon. So um, I pull down the Verizon profile. There's no Verizon coverage here. Let me scrap it. I'm pulling down AT&T. There's AT&T coverage here, full stop. I don't need to go back to Verizon and I've got the technology that I need in order to facilitate this application. What the carriers are afraid of is companies, you know, MVNOs like Telet who are allowing their customers to flip-flop. Um, they're very specific in their, uh, in their stance, we'll say that. Um, once a customer has decided on a profile, the idea is to not go to another profile or you know scrap one and try and flip flop between them for better rates or better coverage. You know, a fleet management application leaving the East Coast and going to the West Coast is not going from AT and T to Verizon to AT and T to Verizon. It's basically uh, the technology is giving you that uh, that fork in the road decision making tree at the time of installation. But once you do that, it's kind of done. You know, you're not going back to another provider. Mm. It's, well, it's these commercial uh, issues that seem to be more the challenge than the than the, the technology. Um, I want to um, so Nick, I want to come to you on, the, on, on an aspect of one of the questions that's been asked by one of the uh, one of the audience, um, uh, specifically related to eSIM and iSIM. I don't, I don't know whether you can comment on this. Uh, hardware module and device considerations that must be addressed for global deployment. Um, so if you're yeah, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of inconsistency in, in approach. So a lot of the hardware vendors, we're, we're ready to roll, but the service providers are, are, are somewhat lagging or inconsistent in their mm -hmm. approach. And it, it requires, for example, specific firmware versions for every different carrier. And all of the global carrier certifications aren't quite as nicely aligned as they were for other pieces. You know, one could, mm -hmm. could argue that maybe there's a the underlying piece that um, that we've mentioned earlier, that arbitrage of flip-flopping between this this uh, option and that option is, is not desirable, so it's being slowed down. But, but I think it is in, inherently complex, and uh, you know we're for the most part putting the offer of dual sims everywhere, even though it's the most expensive hardware option, it's the most expensive to manage, but it's universally adopted everywhere in the world. Anyone can do that. They can just buy a sim and put it in. It, it's kind of considered a backstop. We would ultimately like to see it move to, um, to to eSIM at some point. I think that's highly desirable. Our customers would like that. Uh, it, it's just challenging from, I guess, the, the service provider and MVNO industry. Is it, it represents a, a sort of we can we can just flip to to any provider and it becomes a, a price driven and coverage driven scenario. Although with our customers, I would argue it's purely coverage driven. So we would always uh, aggregate towards the, the, the best network for, for any given customer, because typically, as, as mentioned earlier, price is, is not the driver. Um, so so that, that really uh, makes it challenging for the service providers because they just have an entire coverage play to think about. And some of the other advanced areas that are trying to move up the stack become less important. Um, but you know we're we're strongly behind um, uh, eSIMs. We're we're also seeing this collide with obsolescence. So when we have customers that have devices that exceed the lifetime of the carrier's network, so two G and three G have been sunsetted. One of these days, LTE is going to be sunsetted, and and so maybe some of the the subsectors. So they're they're looking to replace their equipment. Uh, there's a huge hesitancy to put LTE in everything. They'd rather have it in maybe an aggregation gateway and so large scale deployments such as you know, oil and gas and energy sector type pieces, they tend to want to just have uh, LTE in, in a gateway or in a in one device and then put some other um, universal system like LoRa or satellite that will be there for years and years to come will far exceed the lifetime of the product. And so if the industry doesn't really get its act together on this, we, we see more and more customers putting LT just in aggregation points that they can swap SIMs themselves manually or swap technologies by putting 
you know, other other uh, frameworks and as, as new 4G, 5G, and one day maybe 6G come through. Okay. Well, one thing I wanted to touch on, okay, you, you, you mentioned about um, uh, some variation in deployments of, of some of the, 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 so you're thinking about MBIoT and LTM and how those, the, those things are deployed. Do you see this as a driver for selling more combined connectivity with, with, uh, with hardware? Because it's one of the trends that we see happening, right? More connectivity is going to be sold bundled with hardware and vice versa. Just wonder whether you think this um, need to, um, to have the hardware aligned with the network actually drives the, that, that to, to be sold more as a, as, as a, as a combined offering. Yeah, because I mean, our, our numbers are pretty pretty straightforward here. What we find is that people that assemble this in the field, so you buy from a, a range of technology companies to put your solution together and and then install it and put all that together um, post manufacturing, it's about a three year payback. So if you do this all fully integrated in the factory, obviously you need a bit of scale. It doesn't work necessarily for a one off project, but for companies that are, are looking to, to dominate globally, integrating connectivity with their device and integrating their basic application before it even leaves the factory so you're down to maybe just an on switch um mm. drives you know a 36 month improvement in roi on the connectivity piece so that's massive and, and we see that trend is, is not just a trickle it's an avalanche and everybody that is in this space um, you know needs to think about how how we drive forward um, if we look at Talent, you know, they're becoming essentially a full stack provider because they've recognized this. Digi has recognized this not just in cellular, but across all our product lines. And we offer a consistent approach no matter what connectivity uh, because the, the economics are just loud and clear. This thing, when it ships, must work. We want the same model we've had in consumer cell phones. Press the power button and everything works. If people want to get straight into their applications, and in this case, you know, IoT applications, without messing around uh, ad infinitum integrating to um, say enterprise networks, you know, bypass that, put LTE in, um, doing various types of activation um, and, and connecting the, um, the the clouds and the devices. None of that can really be done in the field anymore. And, and clearly we don't have the people, the manpower out there in the field to do that either. So it must be automated. So totally agree that combining connectivity at the factory at the OEM level is, is the future for IoT. So, so Brian, you'll you'll have a perspective on this. I'm I'm pretty sure, given yeah. that you you <clears throat> cut across both of these things. No, absolutely. Um, tell its focus is the bundle, and the reason is the value proposition, the value added services that come with bundling connectivity and hardware. I'm specifically to tell its offering. Um, when you have a tell it module and tell it connectivity, uh, a whole host of new services come to come to come into play. Um, device management software. Um, so there'll be a client inside the module, there's a server on the same side as basically in the same portal as the connectivity and your device becomes a thing. So it's got a SIM card, so you have maybe one page that has the connection, but then you have another page that has the thing itself and you're able to query that device and get over 170, 170 or so data points to be able to like extract information out of it. So, and it can be uh, as simple as a photo, <clears throat> excuse me, as a photo campaign. I wanna push firmware out to my devices, that software comes into play, take it to the next level and you start to query information out of a device from, uh, from a, a connectivity layer or connectivity portal. And there's a lot of value uh, that's built into coupling both of those together. That's what we like about the, top, the Tele product is Put, put connectivity and, and hardware together and the software comes into play. And uh, if you haven't solved the problems that that software solves for you, it's it's pre-built into your solution. Um, so there's there's a lot of value add services that come into play. Excellent. And 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 Ajay, from the from the connectivity provider standpoint, you you seeing this a trend as well? Uh, the the requirement to to bait the connectivity into the into the device, you cross selling. How do you how do you see it? So we've actually made some public announcements about this already in terms of working with uh, you know system on chip vendors, uh, device manufacturers, module makers uh, in terms of selling uh, connectivity with them. The advantage is basically it's one stop shop from a developer point of view. Uh, the one who's actually going to be consuming the overall solution. So that's one. Mm. 
The second is if you look forward, um, one of the things that's going to be coming out soon, it's going to take a little more time for adoption, which is the ISIM. The ISIM is the integrated SIM. It actually is integrated inside the module itself in a secure container. Um, and so with that, uh, you at that stage, you have a SKU, which is a, a, a modem or a module that is actually built for that particular MNO. And the the supply chain at the point is quite well integrated. So you do not have to go purchase another SIM card and go then and install that inside your uh, module or modem or or your development board. It's it's integrated in at manufacturing time. The testing just becomes a lot more smooth and facilitated. And that's going to speed this up even more. Um, so interesting. Um, we've got just a couple more minutes left. I, I'm going to pick on a, a question from the from the audience. Um, how and, and Ajay, I'll stay with say with you. Um, how do you see the growth of self-organized networks like Helium and uh, Pollen, uh, th these types of players? How do you see them playing out in the market? Yeah, it's an interesting question because that's more a. Um, I mean, I have done some research into that in terms of what exactly they do. They have a link also with crypto uh right now um so from our point of view in terms of um these call it um full mesh ad hoc networks is perhaps more the word for it uh, my belief is it's the particular use case that you're going after because even if you look at like a LoRa kind of use cases because the network is less controlled um, so if you're looking for something which is mission critical uh, kind of use cases, anything associated with the government, defense, that's not for this. So if you're mm -hmm. looking for use cases that have less criticality uh, and you also get a, a reward for it on the backside as well, I, I think there's uh, definitely more applicability there. Okay. Uh, Brian, Nick, either of you got a, got a perspective on that one? Well, I think I looking into the economics, if you, if you really uncover the economics of these self-organized networks, like Helium is a classic example. We we fully support the LoRa WAN global standard that's, that's in Helium. We think that is a great idea. Where it's a little challenging is that um, it, it's eff effectively not a standalone system. It requires um, a cryptocurrency speculation in the financial market to support coverage, and that happens irrespective of whether devices are on there. So, you know, building on the, the earlier comments, you've, you've got certain concerns about reliability, but the biggest problem, and I think we saw this with Sigfox, you've got one company dictating the economics of this, you know, purely as a private entity to drive um, their own share price. So when you when you have these entities that with the flip of a switch can, can, can turn the economics of it and essentially the deployment Thus, the coverage and availability on its head in, in such mm -hmm. a short time frame that that control element is ultimately what impacted Sigfox. You know, they had a great technology, but the business model was one company controls the world. Look what we've got with cellular. Look what we've got with, with Laura. We've got global alliances with multiple vendors. No one entity controls the chipsets or the technology. And, and we have uh, the ambition to grow collectively as a community, you know, we, we battle it out with, with market share, but at the end of the day, we all support a, a global standard with a known economic model that, that is sustainable. And these mesh networks are flash in the pan, non-sustainable economic models to, to ultimately try and support, you know, very small companies trying to sort of carve their way into an exit or, or, or an IPO. And so I think for the reasons of economics, for the reasons of um, uncertainty of supply, it, it's a very uh, it's a very challenging area for anything mission critical, anything serious on those that that sort of infrastructure. Absolutely. On on that note, um, gentlemen, we could have gone on for hours. Um, this has been fantastic. Um, there were all sorts of topics I didn't get onto. There are all sorts of questions I didn't get to. Um, but there's another session uh, just lined up in in a matter of seconds. So I have to tell you. Well, first of all, say thank you to my to my panelists, um, and then I have thank to you. say. Uh,
join with us for track four starting at 11 Eastern. IoT bundles, what's new in turnkey solutions for IoT deployments. You will be able to click on the link on the next screen as soon as we close this down to automatically join that track. Thank you.